Hey guys, I'm excited right now because I got Ira Rosa right in front of me and he is the hustle of muscle. He is the Arnold Schwarzenegger of going out there and hustling in the business entrepreneurship world. Uh, not only has he done just a billion dollars worth of sales for fun, but he was also the youngest franchise owner at, at the age of 30. That means not only did he have to go out and buy the cars, you had to, to, to build the lot, build the land, manage the sales team, run the whole floor at the age of 30. I know at the age of 30, I didn't even know what I wanted to do with my life yet. So I, I just wanted to commend you and, and thank you for being on the show today. And I know you've got an amazing business partner uh, with Corey running Social Lead, uh, you know, Social Lead Storm, which has uh, amounted over 500,000 appointments for people. And I just want you to know that I appreciate you spending your golden time with me today and uh, put that out to you and our listeners to get some more information from you. And I want to hear about your story and how you got started with entrepreneurship, brother. Okay. Well, you know, thank you so much. And first, I want to thank you, uh, Daryl. Um, uh, we were at a, you and I were at this mastermind we met for the first time uh, about a year ago, and um, I was so impressed with uh, your heart, your knowledge, and your skill. And uh, for your audience, I got to share, there was a gentleman, uh, Steve Cypress, that was sitting at our table as we were having dinner, and you found out that he had a, a deep fear of heights. And before my very eyes, I saw you uh, dispel that and basically set him free. So that, that kind of blew my mind. And that just, that just really gave me even more respect for what you do. And, um, so just, you know, uh, congratulations on helping so many people. And you, you know, you truly, um, are one of those rare people that, um, is out there and really cares about, you know, others in a very, you know, deep way. So I just needed, I had to say that. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Ira. And it was, uh, it was more exciting even recently talking to Steve and hearing how his life has changed because of that and the things he's been able to do and accomplished. And that's one of my big passions for why it is that I do what I do. But I really want to hear about what you're passionate about. And I know you've been an entrepreneur for a long time. If you wanted to retire and just go play golf the rest of your life, not do anything, you don't because you're still passionate about going out there and being an entrepreneur. Absolutely. And I did try retirement, um, I think about, seven, eight years ago, and I sucked at it, and I lasted about three months, and uh, I'm just one of those guys that just, I, I, love, I love the challenge, I love creating things out of ideas, I love building things, I love building teams, I love marketing, I love generating, uh, you know, because everything in life uh, has momentum, and I love creating momentum, like, um, you, you know, we just all watched the Super Bowl last night, and before the game started, I said to myself, this will be a game of momentum and the momentum will shift back and forth from team to team. And of course we saw what happened in the end. Um, it was incredible, but everything has momentum and, and speed loves success. So everything that I do, um, I really work hard at having creating inertia. So it's kind of like a jet airplane. If a jet airplane is going five miles an hour down the runway, it'll, and, and that's it. It'll never fly no matter how much, it could be a hundred million dollar jet. It doesn't matter. That plane will never fly. And I, over the years, I see so many entrepreneurs that have so much ability. They have great products, services. They're smart, but sometimes they're just missing that last little piece called heart. And just like, you know, I know you played um, a lot of sports and, and football in particular, and you've seen, you've seen athletes that were incredibly gifted, but they just didn't give it 100%. So I think, you know, in order to really be, to me, you know, the, the biggest, the most happy, and the most fulfillment anyone's going to have in their life is not buying that house, not buying that car, all those material things, going on those trips. You know, I've, I've experienced all those things, but the biggest satisfaction you know, aside from your family, which is the most important, but aside from that, is just doing a job, you know, at your very best, because, you know, there's really three different categories. We can be average, um, we can be, you know, really good, or we can be the best. And that's a choice we make every day. And average is an epidemic. Average has no value. Average is everywhere. And average is slow. It, it, it procrastinates. It doesn't finish it doesn't finish the job. It averages, I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. Uh, in the Middle East, in the 1500s, interesting little factoid, um, average meant damaged goods. And there's a lot of people that, you know, because there's no value. 
there's so many people out there that, um, that you know, they'll settle for average. And if you're going to play the game, and there's two games we play every day. We play the inner game, you know, which is something that you really, that's your specialty is your, the inner game. You got to win at your inner game and you got to win at the outer game. You know, building those relationships, being emotionally intelligent, you know, having empathy for others, building, you know, building something and collaborating with others. So that's, you know, that's kind of my 50,000 foot view. Um, I, I really believe in, um, uh, I created this acronym uh, a while back. It's called PDF. <clears throat> and this is kind of cool. And, and your audience can uh, write this down because I think it's worth doing so is, you know, there's th if you do these three things in life, you can have anything you really want, and that is uh, PDF, persistence. He who is the most persistent always wins. Uh, discipline, an undisciplined mind will never achieve anything. Um, you've got to be disciplined, and you've got to be, you've just got to be relentless on your goal. And third is focus. You've got to be just hyper-focused on what it is. I always say you've got to be like a bulldog chasing an alley cat. You, know, you just got to be, nothing is going to stand in your way. It's like the Super Bowl last night, you know, the way they came back and Tom Brady just, he was relentless. He was going to find a way. Now you take the PDF then you put a C in front of it for, for clarity. He who is the most clear always wins. It can't be fuzzy. So if you're going to have goals, you got to be specific. Get really, really clear on what your passion is. Find out what it is and then, then, and then build a roadmap, build a blueprint, and follow that with discipline. And really, and then of course, reach out to others, collaborate. And you can't, you know, these days, we, nobody can go it alone. Nobody. And Henry Ford, um, just think about it. Had he not built an assembly line and collaborated on, how do I build an assembly line and automate building cars? Where would, the, where would our automotive industry be at this moment? I mean, it's just... So it's all about collaboration. This is the decade of collaboration. So those are some, those are some things that are really important to me that um, I think uh, are necessary. Uh, but I think being passionate about what you're doing, if you're not passionate about what you're doing, find a way to fall in love with what you're doing. If you can't do that, that's a litmus test, is you're, you're, you really, you need to find something else because just just chasing money is number one. It's unfulfilling. Number two, it's not sustainable. And I know you would agree with that a thousand percent. A thousand percent. So it's uh, so. Anyways, the other thing about being a successful entrepreneur, eighty percent of the success of a business owner is their marketing. You got to have all these other things in place. You got to have a great product, great service. Um, you've got to have a game plan. I mean, putting all those things aside, once you have your infrastructure in place, it's all about your marketing because, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive a little deep here on this one thing. Um, leads are like oxygen. You know, uh, if you have a great, you could have a great product, but if you don't have people to talk to, you really don't have a business. And so Harvard Business Review did a study on this a while ago. This is the number one reason why companies fail 80% of uh, companies go out or fail within 24 months. And this is the reason. They do product development and they fall in love with their, it's like their little baby and they fall in love with it, which is great. But they don't go into the sales or marketing mode. They wait sometimes three, four, five, six months, sometimes a year because they're comfortable there. And, they're, and everybody likes to do what they're comfortable because they're staying in their comfort zone. So, they have avoidance because they have fear of failure because maybe that's not their expertise. So they avoid that. And that and a lot of times I've seen companies go out of business before they even got started because they, they didn't, they took off their product development hat and they put on their marketing hat and that kills businesses. So um, it, I spoke to an attorney about two weeks ago. This guy was um, top in his class. He was brilliant. He'd been an attorney for about 10 years just kind of limped along, made enough money just to kind of get by. And we had a real heart to heart talk. And I said, you know, I said, Phil, I'm going to tell you something that no one's ever told you. I said, um, and I'm coming from a place of, you know, really just truly wanting to help you. He said, I know, it. what is it? I said, first of all, you have a sales and marketing company. 
first of all, that provides legal services, period. I said, it's not, and he says, oh my God, he said, I went to school all those years. No one ever told me that. He said, had I known that, I would have, you know, I, I would have looked at my business completely different. If you're a, um, you know, if you're, if you're a, um, a, lo a lot of people are watching this are maybe have agencies or consultants. If you're a consultant, you're, you know, you're a sales and marketing company that provides, you know, these services like lead gen and different things for businesses. If you're a dentist, you have a sales and marketing company that provides dental work. So just a interesting perspective on what, how important marketing is because it's like owning a Ferrari and you don't have gas and the, and the car sits in the garage and the guy goes, yeah, I got this $200,000 Ferrari, but yeah, I really don't want to spend the money on, uh, on the gas. And so no one knows he's got a uh, Ferrari, even his neighbor. So the car needs to be out on the road. So um, the rich man digs for gold. The poor man complains about the price of the shovel. <laughs> a great way to look. So you gotta, you've got to be able to make investments into your, into your marketing and your infrastructure. And of course, if you want to scale your, your business, and a lot of people do, you've got to be able to replicate yourself. You've got to be able to uh, clone yourself. You've got to be able to hire great people. Uh, one of the things I learned a long time ago when I was in my 30s, I thought I was – you know, uh, actually, when I was in my 20s, I was in the health club industry, and I had a lot of people working for me. And um, I thought I was, my ego told me I was so good, I was so phenomenal, that I could take, I could take a donkey and turn it into a racehorse. And, <laughs> you know, in other words, projects, uh, people that have got all kinds of problems, all kinds of issues. And, you know, and I love to help people, but I learned that all you get is a trained donkey. You can't, that donkey can never be a racehorse. So, um, so when you're hiring people, this is critically important on picking the right people that are going to fit your culture, uh, which are going to, you know, work together, teamwork. It's just like, just like in sports, everybody's got to get along. There's got to be a good vibe there. You can't have contentious personalities, um, you know, in your team. And then of course, the goal is is to be able to create to create the best possible uh, customer experience for you know for for the people that are with you that are buying from you so that they're you know they've got a problem you're taking care of that problem you know so all great businesses all it is is you connect up with the pain that your prospect has and then take them out of that pain and then give them that amazing um, solution because you're solving something that's very near and dear to their hearts. And so that's when you have loyal, loyal people and you build your brand up because people, people talk about that. And, and you know, Daryl, I know that, you know, you've done an amazing job with people that they tell their friends. And I know you get uh, a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, you know, referrals from happy clients. And that's so important today. I think um, there were so many gold nuggets, and I just, I was over here burning out my pen as you were talking. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, I love the, the PDF uh, persistence, discipline, and focus, and bringing in that clarity and the aspect because you got to make sure you're, you're, you're pointing it in the right direction. You know, and I think uh, one of the things in the Marine Corps is just having clear orders for your Marines, you know, giving them the right commander's intent of like, hey, this is what I want done. I, I need this sector of fire covered, which means that this, this, these Marines know what that means and they line up their guns, make sure they're pointed in the right direction. They're, they're persistent about what they do because they know they'll die otherwise. And uh, the same thing with the discipline to make sure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to, checking on each other and just staying focused, 100% focused because you, you never know when something can happen in, inside your business the same way and all of a sudden you blow up and you got chaos on your hand. Uh, and, and I think the, you know, looking at your, um, looking at your business, the option is the leads, is that new blood coming in the door? Um, it is the, the person who's you know, brand new into your business and looking to come in and actually, you know, hire you. Um, the, staying with those people, I think that's so many golden nuggets you just dropped on us there and just being passionate. How did you like first get bit by the entrepreneur bug? I know you've been doing this for a long time. You look like you're 25, but I know you're a little bit older. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same age, same exact age as your father, by the way. I know, I know. <laughs> I won't say, but uh, uh, my, my, my dad, he, he got bit on the entrepreneur side of things 
it was, it was, uh, he was a steel worker up at that point. He was on the bridge and he was one of the guys that actually would build the bridges. And the guy next to him uh, fell off the bridge and my dad caught the guy in midair. And my dad's a pretty strong guy. He's about six, three. He, he was at previously playing football at the university of Georgia. Uh, pr- very, very strong. And um, so my dad grabbed him, pulled him back up walked him down off of the bridge. Like if he fell, he would have died right then. And um, they, he brought him down off. They, he looked up at the bridge. He's like, I'm not going back up there. And my dad looks at him. He's like, you know what? I got two kids at home. I don't think I want to go up back up there either. <laughs> Cause I realized real fast, I could have died just grabbing your ass. And uh, so he walked over to the coffee shop and uh, back then they call them diners. And um, guy walks in, he's wearing a nice suit. My dad looks over to the guy and says, what are you doing? He's like, I sell real estate. He's like, what do you need for that? He's like, you need a suit, right? Well, this is back, you know, 40 some years ago. And uh, he, he walks in the next day and wearing a suit with the guy's business card in hand. He's like, all right, I'm here to go to work. And he's like, what are you here? He's like, I'm here to sell real estate. He said, all I need is a suit. So very, very blue collar because he, he knew at that point that he wanted what that guy had and he was going to do whatever it took to actually get there. Wow. Yeah. So what wow. was your, when you got started, doing what you're doing. I know there was something that happened. You were like, man, I'm not going to work for somebody else. It was a mindset shift that like, either you saw something growing up or something along the way, you were like, I'm going out, I'm going to be my own boss. I'm going to walk into this, you know, uh, being unemployed like every day. I mean, how did you, where, where did that come from for you? Well, I was very fortunate because I came from a family of business owners and entrepreneurs. So when we'd sit down at the table, um, it was almost like a little mini mastermind. So you know, when you're six, seven, eight years old and you're hearing, you're hearing all this talk about business, I was just intrigued. I thought it was fascinating. So I remember when I was like six years old on the back of these comic books that, you know, I sent away where you could sell boxes of seeds and then get a bicycle or other things. And so I, I just went ahead and I asked my mom if she would help me do that. And, and I did. And then I went door to door and I sold all of them uh, within probably about an hour. And I realized that, wow. I mean, you know, I think I've got a little bit of a knack for this. So they couldn't say no to this little six-year-old kid. I had to pitch down and my dad helped me with the pitch. And then what was really funny was, you know, this was, um, you know, uh, my dad, this is after the war. Um, You know, I was, you know, I was. uh, Which war? uh, Well, this after, no, my, I was about, you know, the war was over in about 45 and what, and in the early fifties, um, World War II is what you're referring to. Right? Yeah. World War II, uh, <laughs> not Vietnam. And <laughs> I'm really, uh, really dating myself here. And so my dad, so one of the things that was really big was, um, people had a lot of money and they wanted to, it was really easy to get government loans and fix your house up. So my dad was in that you know, home construction and, you know, he did very well. And so, um, sometimes they would go door to door, you know, just old school and knock on doors. And, you know, a lot of people said yes, because they had the money and they wanted to build their homes up and they wanted to look great. And there was all kinds of great products, aluminum siding and all those things. And so my dad, every now and then we'd, we'd be driving around and, and I say, dad, that looks like that house there needs, needs your help. And he goes, okay. So we'd get out of the car and then he taught me the pitch. So I'd go knocking on the door and I, you know, I'd start off, I'd say, hi lady, I got great news. I'm not a salesman. Um, I'm with, this is my dad and he's from the factory. (laughs) How old are you? I was about nine. (laughs) And I go, this is awesome. You know, so then, you know, along the way I was always, you know, doing different things and then, uh, you know, just, and then when I was in the health club industry, uh, when I was in my early twenties, I realized, uh, and I did very, very well. I wound up running six, six really amazing clubs. I had about 100 people work for me at a very young age. But I realized, you know what? I'm smarter than the people I'm working for. And, you know, I'm driving the revenue. I'm, you know, I'm, a lot of people thought I owned these clubs. I didn't. And I thought, you know, it's time for me to break out. And so then I bought and started buying and selling used cars selling them out of my house while I'm working there. And my wife I about had a heart attack because we had sometimes 10 cars parked around the block and in the garage and the phone's ringing off the hook and my two daughters are helping me take the calls. So it's just complete chaos. And so then one thing led to another, but I've always loved um, 
money is energy. And when you get money from other people, there's an exchange because you give them something of value. Because when, when a value supersedes uh, the investment or price, you have a transaction. So it's all about, you know, over delivering massive value. So it's, it, and there's nothing more fun, Daryl, and I know you know this, um, you know, from your heart is that there's nothing better than to have uh, a happy client um, call you up or send you an email and just say, thank you. And, uh, you know, like Steve, and I'm sure Steve is, will forever be indebted to you for taking him out of that, you know, that, uh, out of that space where he was trapped in his mind about being freaked out about height. Um, I mean, that's, you know, you changed his life because that opened up a whole bunch of other possibilities for him. Yeah, no, it, and it does. And, it, and that's where I love what I do, what I do by helping people do that. And to watch Steve transform 50 years of fears in 15 minutes was just nuts. So yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah it, it really was. And so one of the things you're talking about when, as far as when you're, when you're communicating to others, whether it's um, for a customer or employees um, your family members, your friends, it's real important that you're really, really clear and set expectations because confused minds don't do anything. They just kind of go, huh? And then they just, it goes over their head and they don't do anything. So it's all about, you know, you know, if you're, if you have a team, it's real important that you're clear on what, what it is that you want them to do. And a lot of times it's really good to explain why you're having them do that and then set the expectations of what you would, what you want from them. And, you know, and like if I send an email um, and I like my VA, my virtual assistants, I want her to do something. Um, I'll say, please confirm once this is completed, because then I don't have to go back and call her. And did you do that? And then, you know, years ago, I never did that stuff. And then they go, oh, you know what? I meant to do that. And that was a week later I asked the question. So that's how things just fall through the cracks and stuff, stuff moves at a very slow pace because, um, you know, which gets into the, the whole thing on time management. I'd like to talk about that for a second. Um, Timothy Ferris, if you haven't read the book or um, listened to the audio, is worth listening to because the core message of that uh, right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, the core message is phenomenal. The core message is um, 80% of our day is completely non-revenue producing. Now, I knew this years ago before that book ever came out. I just, there wasn't a book there to, you know, to reference. And so uh, the trick is how do you flip that around? You know, we spend, you know, there, there's, you know, a lot of, in corporate America, particular people, um, spend, you know, hours and hours and hours in this meeting and that meeting and, this, and nothing gets done. And so uh, as an entrepreneur, what I would do is I would, you know, you've got things that are important, you have things that are urgent. And of course, you know, the it's like if you're a doc in an ER and you got, you know, five people come in and, you know, you got one person that's got a, you know, a severe uh, migraine, you got another person that's, uh, you know, got a high fever, you got another person that's a uh, broken arm, and you got a guy that just came in that just got shot five times. Who are you going to help? Not the guy with the migraine. So, <laughs> so in your day, we make thousands of choices every day. Okay, what am I going to, what am I going to put my time and energy into? Also, what are the things I can do today that will give me revenue you know, as quickly as possible. In other words, low hanging fruit, always look for the low hanging fruit. And, and of course, how can you leverage all these opportunities? And, you know, because if you're just taking care of the things that are fun and you enjoy, um, you know, you're not going to, there's going to be things, there's things that as entrepreneurs, we all have to do every day that we really don't love doing, um, you know, paperwork or, or just, you know, the detailed things sometimes. And that's where the discipline comes in because if you don't do that, you're just going to have, um, uh, you know, the wheels are going to fall off and you're going to just have a, a horrible, horrible situation. Then of course, when you go down that rabbit hole, it's, you lost your momentum. When you lose your momentum, you got to go back and climb the mountain all over again. Yep. Lose that mojo. That's right. You gotta, you gotta <laughs> hang on to that like a, Hanging on the tail of a dinosaur. What, 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 what's one of the biggest lessons? I look at, there's no failure in life. There's only feedback. So what's one of the biggest 
things you've gotten for feedback wise in, in your business career uh, that if you could go back and have a conversation with yourself, you know, how would, how would you avoid it? Uh, what would you do differently? You know, what was one of the biggest lessons somebody could take away and be like, man, I'm glad I learned that. So I don't make that same mistake. Um, I think um, that's a, you know, that's a great question. That's a hard question. I just think that, um, uh, you know, being maybe earlier on in my career, uh, maybe being maybe a little bit more open to some things that maybe I wasn't uh, and not, you know, cause we got critical thinking. And then of course, you know, we have the emotional side of our, of our brain. And so, um, and I'd say mostly I operate off of, um, off of, you know, a lot of motion. There's a good balance there, but I think just maybe, um, uh, not thinking that I could do it all on my own uh, early on. And I learned quickly that you can't. So I think collaboration, uh, I think I'm collaborating more now than ever. And every situation that I get into, I stop and look at it from a very strategic perspective. How can I leverage this to its best possible opportunity? So I'm always looking in the back of my mind, I'm going leverage, leverage, leverage. And then I look at it differently. And the other thing is uh, just your inner game, you know, master your inner game, you know, because we're, the, you know, no one, the person you talk to the most every day, obviously is yourself. So, you know, really monitor that, you know, internal dialogue and, and really spend a lot of time on, uh, you know, really nurturing, you know, that, um, that part of you that needs to be nurtured so that you can always because at the end of the day, it's a confidence game. So I think if I were going to really sum it up, I'd say is really do things every day that are going to increase your self-esteem and increase your confidence. Because he who is the most confident always wins. And uh, if you're going to go in to see a doctor and uh, maybe he's best in class and he, he was top and he was a great surgeon, but maybe he didn't come across uh, correctly, he didn't have the people skills, and he didn't come across confident versus you got a guy that was maybe at the bottom of the class, but he was a great communicator. Guess who you're going to get the operation from? It'll be the guy that's maybe lesser talented, but he projects. So uh, I think, you know, interpersonal relationships, you know, how you only have one chance to make a first impression. And just, you know, the connectivity with other people when you meet them, I think is really really important. So I gave you a long answer there. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of tips in there. What's one of the things that um, possibly you did along the way where looking back on things you could have, you wish you had, maybe it's something that you said or something you did. You're like, man, I wish I could just have that one back. Okay. Uh, th that's, um, yeah, I think, you know, I think there in my career, I think there was, there were a couple of times where um, the, the, you know, I was making some decisions uh, that I probably could have consulted with someone else and got their, you know, maybe somebody that was a little wiser, a little older, that could give me some perspective. Did you ever have any mentors yourself? I know you've done a lot of mentoring with Corey Sanchez, your business partner, and he is a super huge fan of yours, and so am I. And I know I've learned a lot from having conversations with you, talking one-on-one. -on -one. But is there, was there somebody like that for you when you were growing up, you know, back in the day, or you just really, you know, I, I know you talked to your, your parents and your family aspect. I mean, is it, was that pretty much it for you? Or did you, were you able to invest any other areas of your life? I know you're always constantly learning new stuff. And, um, but is there, was there anybody that helped you along the way? Yeah, there was a gentleman um, when I was in the health club industry, um, uh, the owner of the facility, um, all the clubs, he said, you can go to Dale Carnegie and they had like six different courses. And so he paid for the whole thing and he did that for everybody, which I thought was incredible because I love that kind of stuff. I thought, okay, I really want to be, you know, I want to be the very best that I can be. And so along the way, I met a guy who was the instructor. He's probably one of the top instructors in the country. His name was John Elder. And he used to be a member at the club. So, you know, a lot of times after a workout, we'd go next door and have coffee and we became friends. And this guy was probably 20, 25 years older than me. And he was, you know, just very, very wise and had amazing uh, perspective. And so he really, uh, really helped me along the way. 
particularly in those formative years. And I think mentors are very important. You know, find yourself a mentor because if you're going to live to be 500 years old, you'll probably figure it out on your own. You don't need any help. But we're not here all that long. So, you know, why not collapse time and shorten that uh, learning curve? Right? <laughs> I could definitely agree with that. What was the, um, the, the biggest, I would say, golden nugget you, if you wanted to have a conversation with yourself uh, back in the day and you could just pass it on to them, to that IRA back 20, 30 years from now when you started your career as an entrepreneur, what would be that one thing you could just, if you wish you could sit down and have a conversation with yourself, what, what would you say to that person? I would say maybe slow down just a little bit and pay a little closer attention to the details because um, along the way, you know, I was going, you know, going, you know, going very, very fast. And there are some things I could have done differently regarding those kinds of things. And so, um, uh, you know, and so that it, it gets back to, you know, getting out of your comfort zone, you know, so I wasn't as comfortable in that arena. So what I, what I should have done was surround myself with a couple, one or two people that could have helped me with that a little bit better. Uh, so that's, I, I think looking back, that was something that I would, I definitely would have changed if I, you know, had I had the opportunity. And instead of $2 billion worth of sales, you probably have four. <laughs> well, <laughs> Yeah, you, you just don't know, but um, you know, but I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just it, I look at it as just a giant game. It's just it's fun, right? Absolutely, hundred percent. It's all about the game. It is all about the game, and it's, it, it's just and money is a byproduct of helping other people. But um, uh, but I think you know, uh, the, your comfort zone is something that I like to just talk about for a second, if I could. Absolutely. So your comfort zone is not your friend. Your comfort zone, uh, we, I love my comfort zone. We all have rituals. We all have patterns. We all have things. We drive to work the same way. We love structure and those kinds of things. Uh, the problem with your comfort zone is nothing great ever happened in your comfort zone. You know, Edison um, uh, certainly wasn't in his comfort zone when he did all that. You know, when um, uh, uh, Richard Branson did all those amazing things and you know, all these people that, you know, uh, Michael Jordan, um, uh, all the great athletes uh, that you can think, everybody went out of their comfort zone. That is where the opportunity is. And the reason we, won't, we don't like to go out of our comfort zone, it makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable. So the trick to all that is, um, it's, it's getting comfortable feeling uncomfortable. It's like these, I just saw a movie, talked. it was about the, uh, uh, the space race um, back in the 50s and what these pilots had to go through, uh, like these inertia um, wheels that they put them on where they're going so fast that they're, you know, they take them to the place of where they're vomiting uh, yeah. and all the G's and all that. So they purposely put themselves in a position where they're like way out of their comfort zone. And so to me, that's the key to really having, it's like when you're working out, you know, how much can you push yourself beyond that threshold that you think that you can only do this, a great coach will take you up here. No, 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 you, you can do way more than that. And that's the value of a, of a, of a coach, a really good coach. Um, and so, but I think your comfort zone is something you, we all have to look at every day is, okay, am I, am I just, there's a bunch of things I need to do over here that I'm not doing. And I, you gotta really look at that and say, am I doing that? And you know, I have avoidance because I'm not comfortable in doing those things. And so, but, and obviously the more you do them, the better you become at it. Just like when I started, um, you know, there's a point where I started to sell in the very beginning, I was uncomfortable, but, uh, you know, I got, you know, and of course then I got confidence and the more, you know, nothing breeds success like success in everything. Yeah. I wonder, damn, your dad <clears throat> threw you out of the car at nine years old and I said, run up to the door, son, hit the doorbell. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I will say I was um, I was hesitant. I wasn't. I go ah. I said that's okay. It, I'll sit in the car. And so my dad said, No, nah, you can do this. You know, he was very uh, loving and gentle about it. And he just said, No, it's no big deal. I mean, what's the worst thing that can happen? You know, you know, they're not going to call. You know, they're not going to call the cops. You're just going to say no. I go, Yeah, you're right. So, <laughs> so I got rid of my. 
I, at an early age, I got rid of a lot of call reluctance. Uh, flexing those muscles at a young age. I was, and then then I thought, you know, I mean, if you you know, when you're like nine, ten, twelve years old, and you think you're a badass, I mean, that's you know, in, in marketing and you know, like in selling, that's you know, it really gives you a big edge on um, on everything in your life. I mean, just it gives you so much, you know, it, you exude confidence, and people are drawn to you because of that. So I know I know you guys have a, a great program over at Global Mojo. I'm sorry, Mojo Global. That's my dyslexia coming out a little bit, some overcoming adaption myself. But what is, um, what's the best way? Is that the best way for everybody to contact you and to get in touch with about what you guys do? Because I know you're all about, you know, setting people free with the service you guys really is producing mass amounts of way for them to get more uh, leads and more clients into their business right now. And I, I know you're, you do this in spades. You got have classes on it. You have courses on it. And you have different stuff. I know you guys have multiple businesses. Uh, but it was, is the best place for them to go is just mojoglobal.com in, in order to get more information about you. Right, right. And, you know, and our, one, of the big, our, one of our big core products right now is we've figured out how to automate LinkedIn. And so what would take you maybe four, five, six hours to just manually send out messages and all these things, um, we've come up with a platform that automates all of that and saves you four hours a day. And, uh, and of course, we have strategies on, on what to say. We have you know, all the content, all the letters, all the different things you need to do. And so when we were in Forbes magazine, it was really based around the things we, how we help people set over a half a million appointments. Right now, it's probably quite a bit higher. But, you know, it's all about having a full calendar or building your community, building your database, uh, creating a following. And so that's really the, that's the purpose behind the product and that so when we, we started doing that about five years ago that was our intention to be able to help people um, you know find you know find um, uh, leads from the biggest fishing pond in the world which is LinkedIn if you're not on LinkedIn you got to get on there uh, unfortunately less than five percent of people that are ever on LinkedIn have made money because it's kind of clunky and it's hard to navigate through so we've we do that for our customers That's awesome well, I, I appreciate you again uh, coming on to speak to us. I look forward to having you on in the future as a guest. Yeah, well, Daryl, th this was great. And, uh, uh, you know, thank you. It was great catching up with you. You too. And, uh, you, I'm man. sure our paths will cross in person, you know, uh, fairly soon at one of these events or something else. But, um, you know, and I want to thank uh, all your audience for watching this. Anybody that was watching this tells me a lot about them. They care about growing, expanding, and being better. And so um, the key thing is uh, rule number one, never panic as an entrepreneur. Rule number two, never forget about rule number one. And don't let them see a sweat and just be relentless on your pursuit of excellence. You guys head over to mojoglobal.com and get your free leads kit. I know they have an awesome kit over there off their website. And you guys can download that and take action and get in there, that program. I know it's a hell of a program. And there was an individual I was listening to after putting it into use, I can't remember his name, but he had done over 60,000 in sales just in the first month of using it. So it's yeah. a great, great program. Uh, it's not an income claim by any stretch of imagination. Every, everything's going to dictate depending on how much you're going to work. So, all right, guys, I appreciate it. Have a great day. All right. Thanks so much.